Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be here joining you in celebrating um, Open Access Week in its 10th year. Um, and I'm privileged to be giving this 10-minute opening address. So um, coincidentally, uh, 2018 is also the 10th anniversary of the United Nations World Day of Social Justice, which has been celebrated annually on the 20th of February since 2009. So it looks like the theme for today is 10. And so um, I say to myself, what is significant about the number 10? What could I possibly hinge this talk on in relation to 10, since we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of this International Open Access Week? Then I remembered perfect 10, and 10 is supposed to signify perfection. And so I latched onto that and I said, well, if I were to think about how we could perfect open access for us, for our context today, what could we do? What could we continue doing? And what kinds of things could we start doing afresh? And so I thought that linking open access to the concept and the movement of social justice could get us as close to perfection as we possibly could. And so for me this year then, the 10th anniversary of both these two movements is quite important. And this afternoon, for the next 10 minutes at least, I'll try to coalesce them and bring them together. This year's Open Access Week theme, as you already know from uh, Michelle's uh, introduction, it's about equitable foundations and social justice. So in the next two hours, we will mark UCT's historical engagement with the Open Access Agenda and look forward to the future by discussing the significance of equity, intersectionality, and inclusivity in content creation and sharing. Social justice, then, to return to those two movements that coalesce for us this afternoon. Social justice, both as a concept and as a movement, has many meanings and many expressions. I couldn't possibly do it justice today. So I'm just going to nip at the edges, if you like, and highlight a few things. So I think it would be fair to say that social justice is a quest for equity and fairness in relation to many aspects of life. And I think that um, continentally, internationally, we know that the last three years have been in upheaval. Um, various causes seeking equity and fairness in various contexts, um, in various settings. And so I think it would be fair then to say that um, in the short time that I have, social justice can be summarized by saying that it is a search for equity and fairness in many aspects of life, including economic justice, public participation, and social cohesion. Jill Klassen, who will speak later on today, will of course discuss social justice um, in much more detail, hopefully. Um, and all I want to say, perhaps uh, nipping at the edges then, is to say that social justice in the higher education context is more aptly captured in the twin goals or purposes that we've had so often stated in policy documents, such as access and success. Right? I think when we speak about higher education, we always speak about access and success. So the white paper on post-school education and training, which was adopted by Cabinet in 2013, really devoted much of its time and space. The mothership is, is um, <laughs> falling. <laughs> Do excuse me <laughs> while I adjust. Um, and so I think that that statement, um, that white paper, uh, clarified for us and really um, reiterated access and success in the higher education context. So much of what I will say today is going to hinge on that, and I'd exhort those who haven't read the white paper recently um, to return to it and look at it afresh in the context of what we will share and discuss today. Another important national policy uh, guideline is the National Development Plan 2030. It also sets very ambitious goals for education, for innovation, and training in this country. Once again, I would like to, to argue that all of that success in those three spheres actually hinges on access and success in the higher education context. And so open access then contributes significantly to this. And this is why we're going to spend the rest of this afternoon speaking about this. Perhaps one last parting shot, if I may. Um, so open access would give access to, to learning materials that then, of course, would equip us as students and researchers in the higher education context then to succeed at what we're doing, right? So this is why access is a core component of that. Um, I'll move on then to my next descriptive claim and be brief, and that is to speak briefly about open access. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to maintain my belief that all of us here um, have some affinity to open access and that I am, as it were, preaching to the converted. So I don't really need to unpack the context 
the concept of open access. But I will very quickly go through it. And so perhaps maybe to, to go where we've been often before and to maybe just cite or recite uh, one of the most popular definitions of open access, that is Peter Suba's definition of open access literature. He says clearly, simply, that open access literature is digital, it's online, it's free of charge, and it's free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. It, of course, is premised on the consent of the copyright holder to make it available online under an open license. Alternatively, this work could not even be under any kind of copyright protection and, so as a manner of speaking, be in the public domain. There are many types of open access content created for various purposes, for various contexts, but once again, to bring it back to our focus this afternoon, the higher education context and our context today. I would say that the most important category then of open access literature for us, or content, would be open educational resources, which are open materials that are created for teaching, for learning, and research, which many of us create and use on a daily basis. Open source software, of course, is important when we start speaking about um, technology, because technology opens up a lot of interesting uh, pathways and gateways for us. And there, once again, we might have uh, inequities that perhaps we can solve through an open approach um, to technology and the software that runs it. Again, I think Jill, who's going to speak later on when she talks about open access and social justice, may return to these themes. And so I will leave my descriptive claims there and move on to the normative claims. So. Um, Content is not automatically um, in support of equity or advances social justice merely because it is open. Okay? Being open is the first step, but it's got to be much more. So a few weeks ago, um, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams uh, presented a paper on open education and social justice in the global south, in which she used Francis's 2005 framework on the dimensions of social justice to talk about open educational resources. I align myself fully with the thoughts that she shared there. Briefly, there that social justice seeks to address economic, political, and cultural inequalities, and that open educational resources, and indeed any open content, actually needs to be crafted carefully with this in mind. Building on that, I would argue that to fully leverage open access and to, to meet social justice needs, we need to go beyond indiscriminately creating and sharing content. For instance, open content that is available only online uh, may be beyond the grasp of those who have intermittent internet access, those who are hindered by inadequate infrastructure. And so overcoming this and making sure that this material that is open is actually equitably available, economically speaking, then we would need to engage in a number of interventions. So for example, making sure that it is possible to have access to print copies of this open um, resources that are available online would help. Um, addressing the infrastructural inadequacies that hinder access to the internet and therefore to these materials would also help. Who then would engage in these interventions? Well, to a certain extent, every single one of us in our creation of materials, but then of course there's a role to be played by the state, particularly in addressing infrastructural inadequacies. The other thing I wanted to talk about in relation to open content um, and, and its availability is the format in which it is available. So most frequently when we speak about open content online, we primarily think about text-based uh, or written materials. Now this is well and good, but if we are in this quest for social justice, I think that we need to think about other formats for this content because uh, there are certain members of our community who cannot use uh, print or text materials um, to the same extent as others. And so uh, audio materials would be relevant. Uh, multimedia formats would also be required. And when we do have multimedia formats, uh, we probably would need subtitles as well um, for those who, have, um, who cannot uh, perceive the, the audio aspects of the multimedia formats. Some work also will have to be adapted to cater for persons with cognitive disabilities. So for example, um, a text that is perhaps heavily uh, um, that uses a lot of jargon um, might need to be uh, translated into plain and simple language so that it is more easily accessible to those who might have cognitive disabilities. And so really the point that I'm trying to make is open content um, should be available um, in multiple formats so that it is truly equitably available to all members of our community and that also that the online 
uh, distribution is not always the best for our context today, particularly in the global south. Then the second point that I wanted to briefly touch on is that open content that subscribes to dominant epimistic views and languages to the exclusion of others will not have traction in our context. To be culturally relevant, content needs to be grounded in the local context and resonate with our lived experiences. To achieve this then, two things could be done. We could adapt uh, already existing open content, make sure that it recognizes and responds appropriately to our context here and now. Uh, it could be in terms of language translation, it could be in terms of the setting of the knowledge and its applicability. Alternatively, we could start afresh and create um, new locally grounded content. Being a copyright scholar, I think I do need to sneak this somewhere. Um, this can only happen in an environment where we have a clear copyright framework, which makes it clear when we have rights to adapt uh, content in order to meet all of these needs and to advance social justice. And then the third normative um, matter that I wanted to talk about is that politically, users and authors of open content need equitable representation and decision-making power in those at those platforms where decisions are being made about laws and policies that affect our decisions to create and to share open content. And for that reason, this seminar is wonderful because this seminar is an occasion for us all to exercise our agency and to have our voice heard in relation to our views regarding policies, laws, and the options that we have in relation to the creation of open content. Therefore, from an economic, cultural, and political perspective, Open access, open educational resources, and open science can and should play a significant role in the attainment of social justice, particularly in our context, the higher education context. The speakers after me then will unpack a lot of these concepts, starting off with Professor Andrews, who will talk about reconceptualizing the delivery of teaching materials through an open textbook on constitutional law um, in South Africa. Then we'll have an enlightening session which will bring out the voices of students and academics here at UCT on various matters such as the unaffordability of textbooks, challenges in accessing information, and access for persons with disabilities. Hearing a multiplicity of voices is incredibly important, and seminars such as this one are invaluable. Therefore, I exhort all of us to engage with the rest of the seminar to unpack a lot of these concepts to think about if open access truly meets our social justice aims, is truly transformative in relation to economic, to political, and to cultural context, what could we as individuals and collectively do to bring this about? Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody else has to say, and that really is um, all I had to say. Um, this is a very short presentation. There's only one more slide, and all that slide is is a list of references for anyone who wants to perhaps follow up on some of the thoughts that I've shared, excavate them a bit more, interrogate them, and use them going forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to focus on open access at UCT with the social justice agenda. Knowledge production must be for the good of the public. It must not be for a commodity that is accessible only to the affluent. As a social justice advocate, I hold the strong view that access to information is a basic human right, and therefore its distribution must not be driven by a profit motive. According to the UNESCO report of 2005, knowledge should be created and transferred for the welfare of society and integrated into the global knowledge economy. Africa, a continent beset with challenges, is in desperate need for access to information to produce new knowledge that addresses these challenges. However, knowledge production cannot occur if access to published research is restricted. This restriction is due to shrinking university budgets on the back of exorbitant increases in subscription cost of journals. The default position is that academic libraries are forced to cut journal subscriptions. The domino result is that African researchers are cut off from current debates in all critical areas due to the lack of access to publish research. Thus, if knowledge production is a public good, 
And if access is needed to create new knowledge, one does not have to be a rocket scientist to deduce that access to knowledge and research has to be a public good. The removal of access barriers to knowledge and research means that it has to be disseminated worldwide on the internet. This free and unrestricted access to research <coughs> is visible and discoverable to all without payment needed for access, which uplifts and empowers those who have been marginalized in our society. The Berlin Declaration on Open Access to Knowledge in the Sciences and Humanities, an international statement on open access and access to knowledge, stated that the willingness of scientists and scholars to publish the fruits of their research in scholarly journals without payment for the sake of inquiry and knowledge will accelerate research, enrich education, share the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich, which makes this literature as useful as it can be and lays the foundation for uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest for knowledge. In other words, open access democratizes the creation of knowledge. Universities play a crucial role in creating knowledge. The late Kofi Annan, former General Secretary of the United Nations, believed that African universities should be agents for economic growth and development on the continent. It must be noted that 80% of knowledge created by African universities come from three countries, Egypt, South Africa, and Nigeria. There is empirical evidence that shows UCT, a leading African research intensive university, has the highest research output. Therefore, it is imperative that UCT implements its social responsiveness strategy to share its research output for the good of the public, contributing to the improvement of the continent's knowledge, economy, and development. This contribution of sharing research is not only to showcase the research produced by the university, but more importantly, it, de it demonstrates its moral obligation locally to the continent and to the global community. Through free access, the research facilitates innovation on the African continent and ensures that local solutions can be found to Africa's specific challenges such as food security, poverty, health and, and drought, thereby empowering African citizens. In 2014, UCT adopted an open access policy to advance the public good of generating and sharing its knowledge and to engage with the key challenges facing society. This open access policy aims to ensure that free access is available to locally produced research via the university's open access institutional repository. Research outputs such as journal articles, chapters in books, books, open educational resources, conference papers, and reports are available via the repository. However, it is not enough just to have an open access institutional uh, repository to provide access to information to the continent and for the global community. UCT Libraries advances the university's social responsiveness strategy by implementing an open access publishing service. This library as a publisher service is driven by the social justice agenda of making scholarly content freely available to the reader and without cost to the author. This strategy focuses specifically on the African reader and the African author. UCT Libraries is not merely driven to publish, to provide access to scholarly content, but to provide access to so that it is inclusive to the diverse African continent first and then for the global community. We are all aware that Africa is challenged with the high cost of bandwidth, unstable electricity, and cost of access to research. The open journals, monographs, and more recently, open access textbooks are published to provide solutions to these challenges. These recent textbook publications have videos 
and audio clips to allow downloads and then be used offline for when there are electricity outages and to ensure that bandwidth is considered. Also doctors in the rural parts of Africa who don't have the technology or laboratories can view the video clips that show medical procedures that are embedded in the texts. Furthermore, as exorbitant cost to textbooks are a major barrier to student success, UCT Libraries has published an ear, nose and throat textbook, an HIV AIDS atlas, and will be publishing a, a South African constitutional law textbook to contribute to decolonializing education by providing free access. The social justice agenda of UCT Libraries includes publishing local knowledge that publishers would not ordinarily publish as it does not produce huge profits. Some journals that are published have a regional or continent focus with a focused res research niche that may not necessarily be for a widespread audience. Also, more than address regional or local issues, the journal's objective is also to mentor and develop young African research in the publication process, as well as to provide a platform for scholarly output that may not be peer-reviewed but are scientific in nature. This year's open access theme is designing equitable foundations for open knowledge. It is to ensure that the open systems are inclusive, equitable, and truly serve the needs of a diverse global community. As social justice extends the concept of equity by promoting fairness and access to the same opportunities, the libraries is currently investigating integrating software so that texts can be read to the reader. This functionality, devised to cater for the visually challenged, will also serve the needs of those who learn better when hearing the text. It must be noted that a large proportion of the student community are not first language English speakers. Sorry. Hence, the facility to have the books read to the reader enables student success. Thus, these textbooks do not provide a solution to the visually impaired, but also to other marginalized communities, such as those who grapple with the English language. Open access in Africa must be driven by the social justice agenda, as it provides access for the development and empowerment for all those who have been marginalized. Providing equitable access ensures that we are striving for African solutions for the entire continent. I thank you.